Okay, so this is where we left off <clears throat> yesterday. We had just finished talking about how the espionage and the sedition acts led to the removal of certain aspects of American society, particularly people who believe in ideologies like socialism and anarchy. Uh, even labor leaders were, were removed from American uh, society as a result of the Espionage and Sedition Acts, which was seen as a way to protect our nation's security. So today we're going to start with uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois. And W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, we've mentioned him before. Uh, he was, he's the first African American to graduate from Harvard. Definitely, well, to become a, you know, or a PhD from Harvard. Uh, he is an advocate for equal rights for African Americans. And as far as the war goes, Opinion amongst African American people about the war was divided. Not every, they weren't all on the same on the same page. So on the si uh, on one side you have people like W. E. B. Du Bois, who believed that African Americans should support the war. You know he believed that if black people supported the war, that would strengthen calls for racial justice. Um, Whereas other people, like, well, lesser known, like there's this one guy, his name's William Monroe Trotter. He believed that, you know, black people were victims of racism, and so therefore they should not go fight and die for a racist government. So, uh, needless to say, opinion was split, okay? But despite the grievances over the definite racial inequality that existed throughout the United States, most African Americans were on the side of W.E.B. Du Bois to, to back the war, okay? Now, <clears throat> in more concrete terms, tangible, the, the greatest effect of, the, of World War I on African Americans uh, had to be that it accelerated the Great Migration. And that, that is literally the term what it is known as. The Great Migration is a large-scale movement of African Americans from the South to northern cities, urban areas. Why? Well, before World War I, where did the majority of African Americans live? In the South. That's where slavery existed. They became sharecroppers and were kind of stuck. During the World War I, a lot of our labor force was overseas. You know, you remove three million people who would be working, those jobs still need to be had. So African Americans did a lot to step up and fulfill some of those, those jobs in, in northern cities. So you begin to see a, 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 po a great population shift. You know, going to, you know, African Americans want to escape the Jim Crow laws of the South and also have opportunity to work. And you know, it had been a trickle. You know, people had been leaving the South prior to World War I, but <clears throat> as a result of World War I, the trickle kind of became like a tidal wave. Everybody started leaving the South. So, you know, they wanted to, for lots of reasons, escape racial discrimination, escape Jim Crow laws, get a job at a manufacturing facility. People like Henry Ford opening up, you know, doing mass production techniques and needed lots of labor, not to mention work in steel mills, ammunition plants, stockyards, rail, rail yards. So there was opportunity to be had, and they wanted to seize on that, okay? Now... Don't think that just because they're leaving from the south to the north that they're escaping all racial prejudice and escaping all discrimination. Uh, prejudice and racism existed in the north just, just as it did in the south. There were just no laws for cementing it. So um, the, 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 the rising numbers of these uh, 
new migrants to northern cities caused overcrowding and also intensified racial tensions. Okay, which is important for the future. We'll highlight that later on. Okay. All right, women were another group who had an important role in World War I. While African Americans were beginning new lives, women moved into jobs that had previously been exclusively held by men. They became railroad workers, cooks, believe it or not, dock workers, bricklayers, they mined coal, they took part in shipbuilding, all at the same time, you know, women are continuing to, to fill their more traditional jobs as nurses, clerks, teachers. Many women worked as volunteers in the American Red Cross. So the services of women during the supreme crisis of World War I were useful and distinctive and necessary. Now, as soon as World War I ended, all those jobs and opportunities evaporated as their men returned home and would not permit them to, to work. But World War I does a lot, a lot to bring women what? The right to vote. The right to vote. Since they're participating in America, in, a, in an economy, and in government, it bolsters, you know, them fulfilling these roles, it does a lot to bolster public support for women's suffrage or the right to vote. And in 1919, one year after World War I ends, Congress passes the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. So women have had the right to vote for like, 103 years in America. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. That's an important thing for women, obviously, the right to vote. And it all comes out of their, their they stepped up during World War I and gained notoriety and bolstered their support to get the right to vote. Something that had they've been fighting for since the eighteen forties. Okay? You know, that's when the Seneca Falls Convention was, and it finally comes to fruition in nineteen technically nineteen twenty. Okay? All right. This is something you should also be familiar with that was going on around the same time as World War One. And that is a massive epidemic. An epidemic. I don't know why my pictures are so small. We'll fix it. It's a little better. So, yeah, a, ma a massive epidemic. You guys are familiar with that. The United States suffered from a home front crisis when an international flu epidemic affected about 25% of the United States population. The effect of the epidemic on the economy was devastating. Coal mines shut down, telephone service was cut in half, factories and offices staggered working hours to avoid contagion. Do these things sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. So it's not a new idea, guys. They were doing blended Back in 1918, cities ran short of coffins, as evidenced here by this warehouse full of dead bodies, people who died from this, the flu, Spanish influenza, the flu. Um, corpses of poor people, in particular, lay unburied for as long as a week. Pardon the interruption. We need a custodian to the front office, please. A custodian to the front office. The, the illness itself was mysterious. It seemed to strike people who were in otherwise good health. And death could come in a matter of days. So it killed people quickly. 
Doctors did not know what to do other than to re recommend cleanliness and quarantine. That's what they did. One epidemic survivor recalled that so many people died from the flu, they, they stopped having funerals in their town. They just rang the bell at the church because there was too many people to have a funeral for. Okay? So definitely a much worse contagious uh, disease. Um, not, now imagine, imagine that you're in a trench during World War I and somebody gets sick with the Spanish influenza where cleanliness is not possible, all right? So living conditions allowed contagious diseases to spread even more rapidly. More than 25% of our soldiers caught the disease. So you had a one in four chance of getting it. There were some units that were affected so greatly that one third of the troops died of it. Some units lost 33% of their men to disease, this one disease. And it didn't matter if you were a part of the American Expeditionary Force or a German troop. Germans fell in even larger numbers than the Allies, possibly spread around the world as a result of the war. All in all, the epidemic killed about half a million Americans before it disappeared in 1919. So it only existed for a couple years. Worldwide, this disease killed about 30 million people in two years. But much like the war itself, it brought death, but it also came to a sudden end. It just ended. And after the war itself, after four years of slaughter and destruction, the time had come for a peace settlement. And Americans hoped that this peace settlement would be known as, you know, that World War I would be known as the war that would end all wars because of, of the horrific nature of it. We know better, though. That's not meant to be. So leaders of the victorious nations gathered in France outside of Paris at, a, at the palace of Louis XIV called Versailles. V-E-R-S-A-I-L-L-E-S -L -L -E to work out the terms of peace. Who does America send? Who does America send? There's a school in Beckley named after him. Woodrow Wilson. Why does America send Woodrow Wilson? Who's he? He was president of the United States. So this is a big deal. We're not sending diplomats or even a secretary of state. We're sending the president of the United States. That is the level of importance that we're putting on this. Now, President Wilson, smart or dumb? Super smart. Do you think he has a plan? He has a plan, and it's a great plan. Is he successful in getting it accomplished? No, he's a horrible failure. But his plan is great. And his plan is known as the 14 points. Woodrow Wilson had been working on his plan since before the war even ended. And now he's able to deliver his 14 point plan to the, al to the allies, to the victors. Just to you know, I'm not going to expect you to know the four, all, all 14 points, but you need to know the, the highlights here. Some examples would be like, no secret treaties among nations. No secret treaties among nations. What is that aimed at ending? What was one of the causes of the war? Yeah, okay, the Zimmerman note. Sure. Yeah, that's a good, good point. What about just the alliance system in general? Yeah, no secret alliances, no secret treaties. Freedom of the seas? What does that mean? Yeah. 
Seeds don't belong to anybody. You want to you want to send a boat from your country to another country? Go for it. What's that good for? Trade, Trade economy. Uh, tariffs and what is a tariff? Uh, a tax on a tax on imported goods. Tariffs should be lowered or abolished. An American talking about getting rid of tariffs. <laughs> What does that create? What is that? Is a, is a term? If there are no tariffs on Earth, how much does it cost to do trade? Nothing. So it would be called free trade. Free trade. The buying and selling of the buying and selling of goods without fees. Uh, a, redu a, a reduction in military size. You know, militarism was one of the causes. So arms should be reduced to the lowest point consistent for domestic safety. And he also says that colonial policies should consider the interests of colonial people as well as the interests of the imperial nation. So who is this a strike at? Who is this striking out at? Colonial policies should consider the interests of colonial peoples. Who is this intentionally being directed at? Who has colonies? England? France? How about the victors? The other winner? Even the United States. But the United States is trying to rectify that and eventually does. But this is like, hey, you the, with all the colonies in England, or England, you have India and Egypt, France, all your colonies in West Africa and the, and the Caribbean. You need to start straightening up and treating these people better. You think England and France like that one? Mm -mm, no. Now the next, there's like eight points of his 14 that deal with boundary changes. He's going to redraw the, the lines of countries in Europe so that people are more lined up with by nationality. In other words, he's going to redraw the districts to, to the different ethnic groups would have their own countries. And the final point called for the creation of the League of Nations. You ever heard of it? What's the League of Nations? What's the League of Nations? UN. Today, it's the UN, but this is like pre-UN. So what is the purpose of the UN? Mm. Kinda. How about an organization where countries could come and talk to resolve their differences? It was an idea to promote international peace and cooperation with one another. The United States never joins it. Whose idea was it? Woodrow Wilson. The United States is never a member of the League of Nations. Yeah, we can make treaties Who in America. The president has the ability to make a treaty, but all treaties have to be approved by who? Congress. Congress never approves us our entry into the League of Nations. So an American forms it, but an American never joins it. Does it work anyways? No. Well, there's a thing called World War II, isn't there? Yeah. Spoiler alert. Okay. So Wilson's pumped, man. He going, he's going to, to Paris. He's going to have some, some, he's got some ideas. And he's going to like, man, oh, I bet these British and French guys are going to love my ideas. Logan Farley, you need to report to Miss Severs room. Logan Farley, report to Miss Severs room. So, he's super pumped about s securing a peace treaty, but he is also extremely naive about the political aspects of securing peace. 
And his naivete is, is, is exploited by the other allied leaders whom I have pictured here. First is the French premier. His name is Georges Clemenceau. Georges Clemenceau. It looks like George's, but he's French. Georges Clemenceau. Georges Clemenceau is French. He had already lived through two German invasions of France and was determined to prevent future invasions as well as protect the interests of France around the earth. The man in the middle is the British Prime Minister, David Lloyd George. He is a politician who had just recently won an election in England, and his campaign slogan was, Make Germany Pay. And then obviously we have Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States. So contrary to custom, the peace conference did not include the losers. You have no one from the central powers, nor do you have anyone from Russia newly formed Russia, called the Soviet Union. Well, Russia had some problems going on. Yeah. But do you think Russia is an important country in the global scheme of things? Yeah. Yeah, it would be like if America didn't show up. Right? Like, leaving out these important powers was one of the problems that happened at the Treaty of Versailles, which is what we're talking about. But you're right. I mean, I get where you're coming from. But not incorporating the views of large, powerful nations was one of the problems. So Russia not there, which was under the, then under the control of a communist government. None of the smaller allied nations were there. And none of the losers were there. So instead... These three guys and the Italian uh, prime minister, his name was Vic, Vittorio Orlando, they, they, they were known as the Big Four. And they, they worked out the treaty amongst themselves. Now, Wilson can, you know, Wilson's got his plan, and it's a great plan. And Wilson, you know, you know brilliant ideas, but bad politician, unable to accomplish his goals. What does England and France think about the 14 points? You think they like the part where they have to take into the, the account the interests of their colonies? No. No. But out, I'm going to run my empire the way I want to run my empire. Now, they are imperial nations. They practice imperialism, meaning they have an empire. So... These, these leaders meet, and they gather in the Hall of Mirrors. I've actually been there. It's, it's, it's beautiful. And, and they, they, they discuss at the, at the peace treaty. And, you know, after four years of devastating warfare, everyone hoped that this treaty would create stability and help to rebuild Europe. Uh, instead, people's tempers got the best of them. And... The Treaty of Versailles, which is what it is known as today, is largely a failure. Largely a failure. All right, here's what the Treaty of Versailles does. It established nine new countries. Nine new countries are created. It takes out five areas of the Ottoman Empire and grants the, that territory to England and France as a colony. So it makes, makes a pre, one of the losing empires a colony of the winning empires. And the treaty barred Germany from having any army. Germany not allowed to have an army at all. 
Germany's going to lose a significant portion of their territory. And they're going to have to pay reparations. Reparations. What is a reparation? Atonement? Yeah. For what purpose? Yeah. But what's the purpose of the rep? To, to repair. Repair what? England and France. Who's going to pay these reparations? Germany. Germany. The worst part, the absolute, you know, that's horrible. These reparations are an ungodly number. I've, heard, I've seen $33 billion. I've seen $55 billion. It's an un, unearthly number, okay? That is an unearthly number, regardless of what it is. But further, there is the, the most egregious part of the Treaty of Versailles is that there's a clause in there. It's called the War Guilt Clause. The War Guilt Clause. The War Guilt Clause is a provision in the Treaty of Versailles which Germany was forced to sign off on that says that Germany alone was responsible for World War I. Germany alone was responsible for the death, the destruction, the loss of life, the refugees. Germany alone is responsible. Now you see my, my Jim Halpert meme over here? It's the 1919 Paris Peace Conference. That's the Treaty of Versailles. Everyone says it's all Germany's fault and Serbia's like that. Why would Serbia be like that? Wasn't it a Serbian nationalist that killed Archduke Ferdinand? Wasn't that really the spark that started the war? Was Germany even involved in that? No, they got pulled into it because of the alliance system. But ultimately, Germany gets blamed for everything in, in writing. And Germany had to sign off on it. This is humiliating to the German people. Furthermore, the Germans had no way to pay huge financial reparations to France and England. And Germany, what, what, you know, Germany was trying to be an empire. What colonies they had were stripped from them. So the colonies that they had that could have helped them to pay the reparations bill were taken. Not to mention the entire industrial area that belonged to, to, to Germany was taken from them. It became part of France. All of this is a result of the Treaty of Versailles. And we mentioned, you know, we mentioned Russia. Russia lost more lives in World War I than any other country. They did, like, they had fought, you know, they suffered higher casualties than any other nation. And they weren't even included in the peace conference. The Soviet Union lost more territory than Germany did. They just took took land from them. Finally, the treaty totally ignores Woodrow Wilson's idea about the claims of colonized people for self-determination, allowing these colonies to be governments of their own. And I would make the argument which many historians do, that World War II is caused by the Treaty of Versailles. You could almost say that the Treaty of Versailles begins World War II. Now, even though it happened in 1919, because what happens in Germany as a result of this treaty? Horrendous things. Horrendous things. People starving, continue to starve. Their economy is horrible. Runaway inflation... Inflation's so bad, people were being paid in duffel bags of money three times a day. Because by the time they got their money and took it to the store to spend it, it, it was even worth less than it was when they got it. That's, that is runaway inflation. 
Imagine living in a society like that. Oh, and by the way, you're, you're completely humiliated and blamed for the entire World War I as a, as a people. And when things get bad, people turn to some pretty radical ideas. The better things are, you know, people kind of want things to stay the same. Hey, things are going good. We don't need change. When things are going bad, people want change. And when things are really bad, people want radical change. And that's where you get people like Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party. Because things were really bad, and people wanted radical change. Okay? So, I have a little political cartoon here. The Treaty of Versailles made them pay reparations, but ultimately, you have a soldier here making preparations. Preparations for what? World War II. So the reparations, the war guilt clause, the, 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 the struggling economy, the lack of a German army, they weren't even allowed to have a military. That's humiliating. All lead to World War II, which doesn't technically start for another like, 18 years, like 1939, when Germany invades Poland. All right. Okay, so now Woodrow, so the Treaty of Versailles happened. Woodrow Wilson is a, he's a failure. He's failed. But he's there. He's, you know, part of the most powerful nation on earth now. After World War I, America becomes the most powerful nation on earth because, well, our country is not destroyed by war. All our factories are running at full, full steam. France, destroyed. England, lots, lots of issues. So all of our people are, you know, we're sending people home, going back to work. Our factories are running full, full production. And nobody else, everybody else is just trying to pick up the rubble and, you know, have a place to live. So, um, and then now he has to sell the idea of, of the Treaty of Versailles to the American people and get the United States Congress to approve of this because he went and negotiated the treaty and that's part of his job as the president. The executive branch makes treaties, but the legislative branch approves treaties. We have checks and balances in our country, okay? So um, Wilson has a great amount of difficulty convincing the American Congress, in particularly a senator named Henry Cabot Lodge. We're very suspicious of the provision of many provisions in the treaty. So Woodrow Wilson has to travel across America and be like, hey, everybody, contact your senators. Get them to support the Treaty of Versailles. And he literally goes on an 8,000-mile tour of America campaigning to, do, you know, to have it have people contact their senators to approve it. He gives 34 speeches in about three weeks explaining why the United States should join the League of Nations until October the 2nd when he suffers a stroke, a ruptured blood vessel in his brain, a stroke, where he lay partially paralyzed for more than two months unable to meet with his cabinet and really unable to speak louder than a thick whisper. So needless to say, when the treaty vote came up in the, the Senate in November of 1919, Henry Cabot Lodge, that senator, introduced a number of amendments and ultimately it was rejected. So the United States never ratifies the Treaty of Versailles never becomes a member of the League of Nations. Woodrow Wilson does not die in office, but he is basically incapacitated. Why 
His wife does a significant amount of the work. Because she would just be like, she would have the meetings, and then she would be like, well, I'll go talk to Woodrow. I mean, he just had a stroke. He's not really really even able to, 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 to keep up with all this information. So she, for all intents and purposes, is the President of the United States making the decisions. So, poor Woodrow. The Treaty of Versailles caused him to stroke out. Literally. So, um, eventually, once Woodrow Wilson's gone, the United States signs a separate treaty with Germany, acknowledging that the war is over. Woodrow Wilson's no longer president at that point, at that time. But the United States never joins the League of Nations. But we always did send an unofficial observer at the meetings. But we had no power, no voice within that organization. Okay. Questions on the League of Nations? Questions on the Treaty of Versailles? We will talk more about the Treaty of Versailles later as well. It's that important. Okay. All right. So what do we got? Like eight minutes? We'll go ahead and wrap it up for today.